So I write, I write plays as a hobby. Uh, and I have written so many children's plays for Christmas, I could probably publish a book uh, written over 20. Uh, when my former church used to do a live nativity, I could do have fun with the, the children's play within church and just have a Christmas theme to it because they were learning the story through the live nativity. And, but when I'm sticking closer to the biblical story, one of the things that jumps out at you is that Joseph has no lines. Mary has some very quotable lines, the angels, the shepherds. Joseph says nothing except what is you know, explained by the narrator. This morning, we're going to look at the often overlooked character of Joseph in the Bible. Uh, we're going to explore what we know and conjecture uh, and fill in the blanks for what we're not sure of. Um, I'm sure it's going to be different than what you've heard before. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you have heard of this and tell me afterwards. But I'm using research by the Reverend Adam Hamilton, who's a Methodist pastor out in Leewood, Kansas, as a springboard for the message, um, as well as weaving in the theme of peace as we lit our Advent candle, uh, symbolizing peace this morning. And to talk about Advent, just as a reminder, my current devotional that I'm reading explains Advent this way. Advent means the coming. as a time when we wait expectantly. Christians began celebrating Advent in the fourth and fifth centuries. We celebrate the coming of the Christ child, what God has already done. And we wait in expectation of the full coming of God's reign on earth and for the return of Christ, what God will yet do. So it's the yet and the not yet. But this waiting is not a passive waiting. I preached on this last week and it will be a theme throughout Advent. It's an active waiting. As an expectant mother knows, this waiting involves preparation, exercise, nutrition, care, prayer, work. And birth involves pain, blood, tears, joy, release, community. It is called labor for a reason. Likewise, we are a world pregnant with hope and I would say longing for peace. And we live in the expectation of the coming of God's reign on earth. But as we wait, we also work, cry, pray, ache. We are the midwives for another world. Lovely imagery. Let's talk about Joseph, who we read about in the Gospel of Matthew. Where is Joseph, Joseph from, does the Bible say? definitively. If you read Matthew, it says Bethlehem. Now, maybe you have assumed that Joseph is from Nazareth, as I had for many, many years. But if we, uh, if we read Matthew, it says Bethlehem. And some of you real quick ones are already jumping to, but then why do they have to stay at the inn when they go to Bethlehem? Don't, that's, we're going to talk about that in two weeks. <laughs> right? There's a translation choice there, and it's fascinating. It will change the story for you. A little bit. So be here in two weeks to hear more about that. But for this morning, we're going to assume that Matthew is from Bethlehem. When we read that Mary went to visit Elizabeth, that when Gabriel announces to Mary that she's pregnant, tells her that her cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And the traditional location where Elizabeth and Zachariah live is a town called Ein Karim, which is only four miles from Bethlehem. So Mary travels the nine days to, to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Joseph may have heard of this and goes to visit her. It's only four miles from Bethlehem where he lives. It is at Elizabeth's home that Mary tells Joseph that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Just imagine that conversation and Joseph's response. We know he didn't believe her and decides to dismiss her quietly. In scripture, we read her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. 
So let's talk about that. I shared last week that um, a woman who got pregnant out of, out of marriage by law could be stoned to death. So how is it possible that he's just going to dismiss her quietly? So let's think this through. When he calls off the marriage, uh, after he's visit her, visited her, people are going to believe that he's the father. That she got pregnant when he visited her at Elizabeth's house. People would assume that they slept together and then Joseph was the father. And then he broke off the, the engagement. The shame would be on him and not on her. Her family would have pity for her. Her life would be spared. The family would get to keep the dowry. Uh, Joseph would have to provide for the child. And if Mary's father insisted he, insisted, he might have to take her as his wife. But that makes sense of he decided to dismiss her quietly because by law, she would have been stoned to death. And for Joseph, in his mind, you know, he could have told himself, you know, she reaped what she sowed. She got what she deserved. She knew the consequences. He could have gone that route. But after he let go and of his anger, and you can imagine him being angry, and his bruised ego, when he let that subside, he leaned into, he leaned into compassion and mercy. And the author of Matthew calls him a righteous man. All of this before the dream, before the dream from the angel that says to, to Joseph that Mary's indeed pregnant by the Holy Spirit and that he should go ahead and marry her. The story would have played out very, very differently if not for Joseph. I could end it there, right? A little bow. But some more fun facts. Since we know so little, tradition has uh, filled in the blanks, which may or may not be factual. Some traditions have Joseph as an older man. It doesn't say in scripture. He could have been 14. Uh, but being older makes it easier to believe that he did not have relations with her and that Mary remained a virgin for her whole life long. Again, our, tradi our tradition doesn't believe that. We don't pretend to know. But it is important for our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. For Catholics, uh, the brothers and sisters that are referenced in, of, of Jesus that are re referenced in scripture, they believe were probably uh, Joseph's children from a prior marriage, probably from a deceased wife, and that Mary you know, acted as mother for these children, but wasn't their actual mother. And that Joseph interacted with Mary more like a grandfather than as a husband. Our tradition does not see the need for Mary to have remained a virgin. But I want to say, we can't say that our tradition is any less uptight about sex, which I think is at the root of, of this premise. But quite honestly, none of us can know. And no one's faith lives or dies whether Mary remained a virgin. So enough said. We do know that Joseph was a carpenter. Some say a master carpenter. That's not in scripture. But, and, and you also need to know that most of the homes at the time were built out of stone, but we know that he worked with wood. He worked with his hands. He was a laborer, laborer. And we imagine him humble and loving and exceedingly compassionate. And maybe he was old. Uh, and the story from the Gospel of John with the, uh, the woman who's caught in adultery, Jesus says to the crowd who all have the stones in their hands ready to stone her. It, Jesus says the one with, without sin cast the first stone. And then they peeled off from the oldest to the youngest. Because as you get older, you know, right? I was young and stupid once. And there's hopefully we grow in wisdom and in humility. And so we lean into compassion. Most adults where I know where we have been open enough and honest enough to have these conversations. Most adults that I know have seen a glimpse of their own darkness enough to know that they seek to not to have the wisdom to seek the light, to want to live in the light and to be the light. 
I read uh, Frederick Buechner the other day, another daily devotion that ends up in my inbox in the mornings. Uh, and, he, and, and he wrote this, put on the light as your garment. Don't you love that? Gosh, I love that imagery. And as the days get shorter and the daylight is so precious, and I felt that more this year, I think, than any other year of my life. And you know why? Because during COVID and being home, I got in the habit of walking every day of being outside. And now with work and commuting, there's you know, got to plan better. And God, my, my, I need it. I, I want to be outside in the fresh air, uh, the sound of birds, the wind in the trees, the, you know, the stretched back, looking up at the sky to inspect the clouds. And the, and the other day, oh my goodness, and this might've been the day that Frederick Beekner encouraged me to put on light as my garment. I come up this hill and the sun was just, hitting the ground and it was outstanding. Put on light as a garment. Put on light as a garment this Advent season. Light a candle, be a light of hope and of peace. And now this is where I, I tie the story of Joseph together with, with this theme of peace. We talk about no justice and no peace, and that's true. If there's injustice in the world, there, there cannot be peace. We just read about Joseph, who could have demanded justice, the law, right? That the law be enforced, and Mary would have been stoned. But let's consider for a second, was the law just? It's a good question. And we always need to be asking ourselves, questioning, you know, questioning ourselves. And remember, we are from a tradition that's called reform tradition. We believe that we're reformed, but always reforming. Uh, so we question our motives. We acknowledge our darkness. We acknowledge our mistakes. We're always trying to do better and be better, recognizing that we're always going to be trying to do better and be better. But we're always going to have confession as part of our worship because we need it. At the end of the day, Joseph chose the path that gave him peace, the path that allowed him to live with himself. And note, it was not the easy path. And the story I'm about to tell is about a famous person, but I don't remember who it is, but I remember, but I remember this. Uh, some, many, many years ago, somebody showed up to at a demonstration or a protest, one of only a few people. Eventually, you know, like decades later, the change happened, but he, he was there at the beginning. And somebody asked him, why are you showing up? This isn't going to make a whit of difference. And, and the person responded, the difference is in me. How do I live with myself if I don't show up? How do I live with myself and not protest because this is not okay? This is humbling stuff. There is so much in the world that needs needs us to show up as light, seeking peace, working for justice. So who are the Marys? Who are the powerless? Who is afraid? Who is at the mercy of other people's kindness? Who are the victims of other people's indifference? And, and I know it can be overwhelming. Gosh, this week, another school shooting a nation divided over vaccinations, families divided, people talking at each, at each other and not to each other, not listening, not seeking to understand. And still we pray for peace. Here's an Advent truth. There is God's work and there's our work. Our work is to put on light as a garment, to let our light shine, to work for peace. I pray that we all might live in such a way that, that we can look ourselves in the mirror, that we can put our heads down to rest up in the evening and sleep well, not because of our ease or comfort, but because we have peace with our decisions and with our choices. And when we get it wrong, this is a prayer, Lord, wake us up. You know, bring on the dreams and give us courage to follow in Joseph's footsteps. And to God be the glory.
this day and forevermore. Amen.